All right, we're going to get ready to get started for our what should be a Monday night teaching is um, now been pushed over to Wednesday. Um, I'm not going to be doing this every week, but I'm going to try to do this periodically for this is kind of just to replace the um, the YouTube videos that I've been doing um, because I just don't want to deal with YouTube anymore. And you know, I don't know. I feel like I get more of an audience with this. And, you know, time will tell unless, you know, Facebook decides to shut me down again. So um, we have a little less than an hour, um, kind of on a time frame about this, but we're going to talk about a three-part series. Um, it's actually a teaching that I did last year. Um, maybe some of you guys that are online today um, have gone to one of my conferences last year where I taught this. It was a two-day thing um, called Coming Behind the Veil. So technically, it's a CD that I put together um, last year, and it's actually three hours long, and it's talking about hearing how to hear the voice of God for yourself. Um, of course, when I teach it in places and conferences and churches that I've gone into, it's usually a part one and a part two, like for the times that um, I went into ministry and we had like two days where I would speak. It's not something that you can combine into one teaching. It's just way too long. Um, that's why I said I have a, um, I have a, um, a three-part teaching on it that I am still trying to figure out if I want to promote it this year. Um, perhaps I'll do it, but y'all kind of know how I feel about that. Um, anyways, so we'll go ahead and get started. We're going to go over scripture too um, in regards to this. Um, so here's the big thing. The biggest problem that I have found in the church today and um, throughout the 10 years that I've been in ministry is that people do not know the voice of God for themselves. Um, that seems to be a big struggle um, with a lot of people. And what has happened is that, you know, we have become accustomed to people that we know hear the voice of God, you know, a pastor, a prophet, especially a prophet or someone with the, with the title of prophet, you know, apostle, an evangelist, a bishop, um, you know, uh, the first lady of the church, you know, all these different titles that they have, um, teachers even. And what happens is that once we, we find someone who we know hears from the voice of the Lord, we depend on that person from a word of the Lord. Even go as far as like asking somebody, well, do you have a word for me? One of the things that probably the most irritating thing that I've heard, and I've mentioned this before, and I'll say it again, is when people send me emails and people send me um or they call me or they inbox me on Facebook and they say, well, can you ask the Lord for me? And the reason why that is so annoying to me is because, one, I am nobody special from you. I have a calling. I have a office that I'm called to. But the Bible says he who dwells in the secret place of the most high. That's, that's not limited to anyone. It's not limited to man, woman, child, age, race, background. It's, it's anyone. And so when people come to me and they're like, well, can you ask God for me? I'm like, uh, no, because we're supposed to be serving the same God. And, you know, not, will God use someone? Will he use a prophet? Will he use a preacher, an evangelist, or, you know, a, some person with a gift of prophecy? Will he give people a word for other people? The answer is yes. But Old Testament style, the reason why there were prophets in the land is because there was a lack of relationship between man and God. And what separated man from God was sin. It, it happened in the Garden of Eden. And so um, God was known in the Old Testament to speak amongst the prophets. So we have the prophets. We have Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Obadiah and Nehemiah and Zechariah and Zephaniah and Haggai and all of Malachi and all these people that were revered and, and highly respected and feared in some cases. And people, kings knew that these people heard from God. And most of the time they listened. And sometimes we know that they didn't, you know. And, and so, but, but there was, that was during a time where there was like a famine in the land for relationship with God. And so Christ 
whom, remember he said he didn't come to um, abolish the law, but to fulfill it, okay? So, you know, that's a whole other story. But part of the reason why Christ came, because there's many reasons why he came, was to reconcile us back to the Father. So when we go into the book of Genesis, we find that um, the Bible says that Adam walked, walked with God. You know, Adam could literally see into heaven. And Adam communicated with God before he said they had a relationship. They they talked. They the Bible says that God walked in the cool of the evening of the garden. He do you imagine the spirit of God? I mean, this is God we're talking about, who is walking in the cool of the evening of the garden to communicate with Adam. All right, so when when Adam sinned, when Adam and Eve both sinned, this this changed things. Okay. In fact, here's something that's a deep revelation. So, um, you know, when Adam said, you know, they, him and Eve, they hid, and the Bible tells us that they, that they um, sewed uh, fig leaves together and they, they hid themselves, right? And so the, the Bible tells us that God, he, he walks into the cool of the evening. And what is the first thing that God says? He calls out to Adam, right? He's like, Adam, where are you? Well, this is God. This is omnipotent, omnipresent, magnificent God. How could he not know where his baby had hidden? Of course, God knew that Adam had hidden himself. Of course, he knew that him and Eve had sewn these leaves together, hidden themselves. So why did God say, Adam, where are you? What was, what was the revelation behind that? Well, here's the thing. When Adam sinned, the moment that he said, there was a separation. And just merely God calling out to Adam and saying, Adam, where are you, was the first step that God took towards mankind in trying to reach his children once again. Okay, so we know 4,000 years after that, Jesus is born of a virgin. And again, one of the main purposes of Christ becoming the sacrificial lamb for us to atone for our sin. Being that high priest in the order of Melchizedek who reigns forever and ever is so that we could be reconciled back to God. And Jesus is the door. He's the key. He's not where we stop. We stop at the cross all the time. But that's not where we're supposed to stop. I've taught that. A lot of people, are, they look at me mesmerized when I'm going into place. I'm like, Jesus is the door. The goal is the Father. Remember what he says. What's the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. Notice this is what Jesus says. Okay, so this was given to Moses. We find this all the way back in the book of Deuteronomy. And then Jesus repeats it it's again in the Gospels in Matthew. And notice he doesn't say love me, being Jesus. He didn't say love Jesus. He said love the Lord your God. He referenced it back to the Father because the whole purpose of Christ's coming was that Scripture be fulfilled so that we can be reconciled back to the Father. And that is why Jesus never took any glory for himself. He only glorified the Father. And he always sent all glory and all honor to the Father. So the goal is that we get reconciled back to the Father. Okay, another scripture. Proof of that. So we go into the Beatitudes in, in Matthew chapter 5, okay? And, you know, blessed are the me, blessed are. Okay, so when we get to the pure heart, what does it say? It says, blessed are the pure at heart. For what? For they shall see God. So the reward of having a pure heart is not that we get to see Jesus or the Son of the Messiah, the Mashiach. No. It was that we see God. And this is Jesus talking this. He's the one who said it. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So the reward of keeping your heart pure is that you get to see God. Okay? Okay, so some more. We're going to go into the end of the Bible. And the book of Revelation is mentioned twice. Uh, towards the end of the chapter, chapter 20, chapter 21, there's two times that we mention it. It talks about, and so in the end, after the seven-year tribulation, after the millennial reign, after the new heaven and the new earth and the great white uh, throne judgment seat, and all of this happens, the Bible talks about how God, God himself, will come and live amongst his people. 
And the Bible tells us what it says. And he shall be our God. And we shall be his people. And we shall see his face. Remember that? Okay. So that's at the end of the Bible, the book of Revelation. So the whole goal, the whole story from Genesis to Revelation, okay, is about us coming back to the way it was in the beginning to the garden, to be able to communicate with God, okay? All right, so how does that all tie into the, to the coming behind the veil? So we know that, that when the Israelites came out of Egypt, God has given, gave uh, Moses what is what we call today the Torah. And the Torah is nothing extra special. It's just the first five books of the Bible. I mean, people think that the Torah and the Bible are two different things, but it's not. It's the same thing. And and God has, has inspired and given the Torah, which means law in Hebrew, to Moses for the people to sanctify them, to set them apart so that they will become a peculiar people, a sanctified people, a holy people, okay? Meaning it was his way, see, see, the Torah was the beginning of the purification process that God wanted to be reconciled back with people. So he started with Moses. He started with the Israelites, who were his chosen people. He chose them, the seed, the descendants of Abraham. But later we know in John chapter 3, starting at verse 16, that the whole goal was not just for the Jews, what he knows, the Jewish people, but for the world, because the Bible says, for God so loved the world. He started with a certain group of people, but that he never intended to stay there. His goal was to give an opportunity for the entire world to come back to him, to be reconciled to him. See, God is daddy, he's Abba. What father does not want to be reconciled to his children? We're his offspring. We are. We all came from him. And his desire is that we return to him. But what determines whether or not we return to him is the decisions that we make in this in-between thing called life. But nevertheless, Abba's desire for us always is to return to him. He wants us to return to him. So here we are. We're sitting here 6,000 plus years later, 2,000 years since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we sit in these modern churches. And somehow we have been lost in translation into believing that God doesn't talk to us. We don't realize that what is happening is that we're going, we're, we're actually being bound in the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, he spoke to the prophets only. He, he revealed himself to whoever he chose to reveal himself to. But everybody didn't hear from God. That's the reason why dreams and visions were so important. In the Old Testament, they were very important. And, and there were many angels that came to visit. There were messengers of the Lord. And that was deemed very important because there was there was this gap. There was this, this separation. But see, Christ came to merge all of that. He came to merge. That's why he said, I am the way. Remember that? John chapter 14. He says, I am the way. Well, what's the way? It's not just the way to heaven. It's, you know, we, 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 we've been preconditioned. It's not just the way to heaven. I am the way, right? He's the way back to daddy, back to Abba. He says the truth and the life. So we, we talk about the truth. So when he's standing before Pontius Pilate, what did he say? He said, I was born for one purpose, to bear witness to the truth. All who know truth will hear my voice, right? Listen to that. He said, all who know truth will hear my voice. Well, then, you know, Pontius Pilate's famous lines, well, what is truth? But we find in the scriptures that Jesus never answered Pontius Pilate. Why? Well, because truth was standing right in front of him. And Pontius Pilate couldn't comprehend that truth was standing in front of him. So what was Jesus' purpose to bear of coming to earth? Another reason, because there's these multiple reasons that Yeshua came. Well, it's to bear witness to the truth. What is he bearing witness to? What's the truth? That God existed. Because at that point, no man had seen God and lived. Even Moses, one of the greatest men that walked the earth, had to see his backside. He had to hide behind a rock. And, and God passed by. 
and he could only see the backside, the trail of his of his robe. You know, but that's not how it began. It began with man coming face to face with God in the Garden of Eden because there was no sin. See, God is holy. There is no sin in him. No sin can stand before God. There is no gray in him. There is no darkness. There is no compromise. There is no justification. God is holy. That's why he said, "Ye be ye holy, for I am holy. You have to understand that God doesn't suggest that you're holy. He requires you to be holy. And, and we've gotten away from holiness. That's part of the reason why we're not hearing him, because we're not living holy lives. And holiness is not about what color clothes you wear and wearing, you know, white button up. It, see, we, we've got all of this. We have misconstrued so much. We have gone into our carnal way of thinking and we've laid down rules that are not even biblically based, and we've missed the point of how to enter in. It has nothing to do with makeup, whether or not you wear makeup, whether or not you wear jewelry, whether or not your hair is covered, whether or not um, you're in a specific denomination, or whether or not you're following the Torah and the feasts, or whether you go to church on Sunday, or whether you say Happy Easter. See, that has nothing to do with holy. Holiness comes through circumcision of heart. Heart. So we've done away with the physical circumcision that God re required the, the Jewish people to do with the foreskin of the, of, the, of the eighth day of the male children. But now, male or female, we have to have circumcised hearts. Removing the foreskin. What does the foreskin represent? The carnality. The foreskin is a flesh. It's, it's this extra flesh. And, and that's what it is, right? And so the extra flesh was removed. It was taken off, right? Because it was a hindrance. It was a hindrance to the seed. That's the reason why. I mean, they, they, they have all these other medical explanations for it. But the fact of the matter is, is that the foreskin prevented a clear way in the way it prevented for the seed to come forth. Right. And so think about our flesh. Our flesh prevents us from producing fruit. It gets in the way. Right. When we're carnal thinking, carnal minded, when we're always focused on this or we're so busy trying to nitpick and find what's wrong in a bunch of people instead of judging what's in our own hearts or going before the father and asking him to reveal to us what's in our hearts. We're not circumcised. OK, and we can't come before the throne of God in this fleshiness. We can't come before God with this foreskin of carnality on us. We can't. It's going to prevent the seed from coming through. OK, and so all of this has happened and, and we're, you know, centuries down the line into the modern church where people don't believe that God talks to them anymore. And there's a hunger. There's a famine in the land. There's a famine for God's word. There's a famine for the voice of the Lord. And it's not that God has turned a blind eye and a deaf ear. It's that we have not come into the understanding. We have lost understanding because at one point it was there and we lost it. It's been watered down. It's been watered down by denominations, by secular input, by, you know, television, by technology, by books. And nobody's getting in the word anymore. People are not writing books. Someone wrote when I was asking about suggestions on what to teach. Somebody was talking about, um, somebody suggested that I teach about the kingdom of God. And someone responded. When someone responded to it, they responded by saying, oh, you want to know about the kingdom of God? Well, you should read such and such book by so-and-so, and then you should go read this other book called such and such by so-and-so. And I looked at that answer, and I just said, no, just read the gospel of Matthew. You want to know about the kingdom of God? Turn to the gospel of me of Matthew. Is not there... Uh, what 70 something parables and the kingdom of God is likened to and the kingdom of God is likened to this and Jesus told all the parables in the book of the gospel of Matthew what 28 chapters talking about the kingdom of heaven but the first suggestion was to go buy a book 
And see, these this is where we we've, we've gotten lost in translation here in the West and the American church, and we have we have lost our way to God. But God never left. It's us that left. And we haven't come to reality. So I'm going to go into a scripture. We're going to open up. Like I said, we might do this in three sections. Maybe we'll do it in four. It just depends on what time it is. And the funny thing is that every time I teach this, even though I have a set teaching for it and I have CDs for it, but every time I teach it, God just gives even more revelation, new revelation. So, you know, we just let the Holy Spirit flow um, like he wants to. We let him have his way. It's not about me. It's about what the Holy Spirit wants. So the scripture that we based, I based my teaching, this was not my teaching, is God's teaching off of is actually in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So I'm going to read it to you starting at verse 4. Um, mm, 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 mm. We'll read from verse 4 to the end. And I'm going to be reading out of my One New Man Bible. Oh, you guys like that? See? Everybody talks about my One New Man Bible. All right. So this is what it reads. It says, it's starting in verse 4. So it's 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting at verse 4. It says, and we have such as in, excuse me, and we have such as this in confidence through the Messiah to God. We are not qualified because of ourselves to reckon anything as from ourselves, but our competence is from God, who also qualified us as servants of a new covenant, not of letter, but of spirit. But the letter or the law is what they're talking about, or kills, but the spirit makes alive. So it's talking about the old covenant versus the new covenant, the Old Testament versus the New Testament. The word testament is another word for covenant. Verse 7, but if the ministry which was of death and letters and carved on stones came in glory so that the children of Israel were not able to look upon the face of Moses because of his radiance, which was to cease on his face, most surely will not the ministry of the spirit be in more glory. But if the ministry of condemnation has glory, then the ministry of righteousness bounds in much more glory. So it's talking about, again, the Old Testament version of it. So in the Old Testament, you know, Moses went up on Mount Sinai, right? He went and he got the 10 first 10 commandments. God laid, added another uh, 600, what is it, 613 laws. He added another 603 later, but he comes off of the mountain and he's got 10 commandments, right? But the Bible talks about how his face glowed. It glowed. And it glowed so much that he had to wear a veil, the glory. And that was the glory of God in the law which Paul tells us just brought death. The law didn't redeem man. The law only showed us just how wicked we had become. So the scripture says if there was glory in the former, that was already fading away when Moses had to wear the veil, then how much glory is it in the new covenant, which brings life? Life in the new covenant. Who is what is the new covenant? The new covenant is Christ. He is the new covenant. We just we just got through with Passover, the Passover lamb celebrating the the lamb uh, that started in the book of Exodus, where the angel of death death would pass them over those who had placed the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, and we fast forward it. A, a thousand years and we have Jesus that's manifest the word of God that is manifested in the flesh and now he becomes our Passover lamb so that we can so that the eternal death can pass us over and here's the interesting thing his covenant the blood covenant reigns forever and ever see because in the Old Testament the most powerful covenant there are multiple covenants there's salt covenants there's all these different covenants in the Bible and the Old Testament but the blood covenant could not be broken unless it was through death so if you had a blood covenant with someone then that lasted for as long as those people were alive the the covenant was ceased to exist only when those people died but think about Christ is this is that though he died yet he lived and he lives forever and ever. So that means that his covenant reigns and rules forever and ever. It's eternal. So again, he came to fulfill the old law. He, it didn't go away, but it became a fulfillment, which brought us death. But now the new covenant through Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, who lives forever and ever, is a covenant that is everlasting. And so therefore, it is more glorious. 
It is more powerful. So the Bible says in verse 10, it says, For indeed, what had been made glorious, the glow on Moses' face, is no longer glorious in this matter on account of the surpassing of this, uh, oh, excuse me, on account of the surpassing glory seen on Yeshua. For if that which was passing away is in presence of glory, much more will the one remain forever in glory. And that's Christ, Yeshua. We know that when Jesus died, there's a lot of things that happened. You know, we gave up the ghost, but there was an earthquake, but the Bible talks about the veil was torn. Remember the veil in the temple? It was torn. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And the sim- what was symbolic about that veil being to see that veil is what separated man from the Holy of Holies. What existed in the Holy of Holies? The Spirit of God. The Spirit of God existed in the Holy of Holies, right? So let's go to the Old Testament. So the, the Bible tells us that, you know, God commanded Moses to build a tabernacle. We're going to talk about the temple just yet. God commanded Moses to build a tabernacle that had three layers, um, outer court, inner court, holy of holies. And when you get to um, the inner court and the holy of holies, there was a veil, okay? And God was very specific about this veil and the colors that it had to be and all of these things. And behind that veil was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was where the Spirit of God existed. And so not only could just nobody go into it, but only one person, only one particular person, and that was the high priest, all right? And he had to be without spot or blemish. And and so this was the most holy, the Holy of Holies was also called the most holiest place. That was another term for it. And so this veil that stood outside, which separated the Holy of Holies from the inner court, was was to separate. No one could just enter into that. Okay, if you went into that area and you were not uh, properly um, prepared to go into the area, want hold to be in that area, and you would die. You were you were cut off. It was a wrap. Okay, and so. Jesus died. He said, it's finished. Well, when he said it's finished, it's accomplished what he had came for. He had came to become the, the, the sacrificial lamb, to sprinkle his blood on the mercy seat, to redeem mankind back to the Father. The veil was now torn. The separation that had been going on for nearly 4,000 years was now over. Now through the blood of Christ, We can enter in. Paul tells us, and I believe it's the book of Galatians, he says that because of Christ, we as his children can now come boldly and confidently before the throne of God. Notice that that because of Christ, we can now come boldly. Think about boldly. We're not all hutched down like this. I'm not talking pridefully. But boldly means that we know that we belong. We know he's daddy. Think about when you want, want something from your daddy. Daddy, can I get some candy? Daddy, can Daddy, can you fix this for me? We get when we're confident in our father, we can climb up in his lap and we can ask him for things. We know that's daddy. Daddy's gonna protect us. Daddy, daddy can fix all the things that are broken because daddy's our superhero, right? We only miss so many daddies today. So many, so many of us have grown up without our fathers. We live in a fatherless generation, and, and that's another story for another day. But that's all a part of the, the trick of Satan, too. We, we grow up so fatherless, and then we have issues going to our spiritual, our heavenly father. Because we don't have a natural father to go to. But the Bible says that because of Christ, we can now come boldly and confidently before the throne of God. So we can enter in because we know who we are. We're not lost children. We're not orphans. We're children of God now. And we can go to Abba. We can go to Daddy. And we can say, Daddy, there it is. Look at this, Daddy. It's broken. Fix it, Daddy. And he'll fix it. He's not going to turn you away. He's not going to despise you. He's not going to, he's not, he's, he's going to say, okay, give it to me. I'll fix it. See, 
But we we put God in the box. We turn God into a religious object. We go before him religiously. And he's not listening to all of that. And we'll talk about that as the days and weeks go by. So let's finish the scripture. It says, starting in verse 12. Since, therefore, since we have such hope as as this, we proceed with much freedom in speaking, not just as Moses was placing the veil on his face so that the children of Israel did not look intently to the end of what was to be done away with, the glow on his face. But their minds were hardened, for until the present day, the same veil remains on the reading of the old covenant, not having been unveiled because the veil was removed by Messiah. See? But until today, whenever Moses would be read, Moses being, you know, the, the, the scriptures, the Torah, the veil lies upon their hearts. You're talking about the Jewish people and anyone else who has fallen into this, this, this orthodox you know, belief of Judaism of we have to follow the old laws. That veil was removed by Messiah. Verse 16, but whenever someone would turn towards the Lord, the veil is taken away. Okay. And the Lord is spirit, verse 17. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Know that? Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. See, Christianity is not a bondage. It is a lifestyle. You know, we, look, Islam is bondage, all right? Mormonism is bondage. Uh, Hinduism is bondage. All of that other is bondage. But when it comes to the way, walking in the footsteps of Christ, there is freedom. Freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, the so old Judaism, uh, believing in the orthodox way, is bondage. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Did he not come to set the captive free? Jesus came back from uh, being tempted by the devil, and he goes into his hometown, and he begins to read Isaiah, and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me. To bring good tidings to the poor. He said, he has sent me to set the captive free. To give sight to the blind, to mend the brokenhearted, to declare the day of the Lord is at hand. He sent them, but he said, I came to set the captive free. The Bible says, and who the son sets free. is free indeed. Meaning free in totality. Not partial, but totality. So what is the freedom? See, because of sin, because of what Adam did, he bound us. People couldn't come into the tabernacle, right? They couldn't come behind the Holy of Holies. They couldn't really talk to God. God kind of picked and chose, chose who he wanted to talk to. He talked to Abraham, or he, if he didn't want to talk to you, then he sent, he sent Gabriel, or he sent Michael, or, or whoever, you know, or he's, and, and then he had his prophets. And so there was, just a, there was a form of bondage behind that. But when Christ came into the picture, there was freedom. Freedom to come boldly and confidently before the throne of God. Now you have freedom through the blood of the Lamb to come and address your Father, your Abba, and to hear Him. Hear Him. See? It says, just wrapping that up. Again, verse 17. And the Lord is spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Verse 18. And we all, by raising the veil, are transformed from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord to behold for oneself the glory of the Lord. See? So, when I teach about coming behind the veil, when I've taught about it in the past week, we, I base it on... The tabernacle, the tabernacle had three layers, outer court, inner court, holy of holies. We know that the tabernacle later became Solomon's temple, and then after they all rebelled for 490 years, God sent Jeremiah to King Zedekiah, warned that Babylon was coming. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed the temple. 
took the artifacts, took what well, we don't know what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. But the Ark of the Covenant after the first temple was never recovered. A lot of people don't realize that. By the time the second temple was built, which, okay, Ezra and Nehemiah, along with Zerubbabel and Jeshua during the time of, of Zechariah and some other prophets, they came, they came out of exile, and Zerubbabel was given um, the okay, I guess, you know, or the assignment to rebuild the second temple, which they did. And then later on, King Herod the Great beautified it and magnified it to an even more greater thing than what it was prior until 70 AD when the Romans came in and burned it to the ground again. And it was never, never rebuilt until this day, 2000 years later. But by the time that they built that second temple, they never recovered the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was gone. And so when Jesus tore that, tore that veil, what was behind that veil was nothing more than scriptures. It because no one knew where the Ark of the Covenant was, and they still don't know to this day. Well, there's you know all this different speculation of what happened to it. But the truth is, is that we don't know, at least we don't know. Maybe the Sanhedrin, the new Sanhedrin knows, but we don't know where the Ark of the Covenant is. The point is, is that the second temple was missing the Ark of the Covenant. They only had a veil, which I thought was very significant, which we'll talk about sometimes because of their rebellion kind of allowed it to be taken away, you know, which is interesting because, well, anyway, that's a whole nother scripture or another time, another teaching. So now we don't have a temple. Well, you know, the Jewish people, they don't have a temple. They don't, they're not sacrificed, and then there's no need for it because, you know, Messiah came, Mashiach came, and he became the Passover lamb for us. So the Bible later tells us in the New Testament that we have become the temple. The Bible tells us in Corinthians, I mean, Paul talks about it, that our bodies are a holy temple of the Lord, and it is our duty to keep it holy. See, God, God was very strict about temples. All right. You didn't desecrate temples. You didn't defile temples. God would make God very angry. And we had some cases in the Old Testament where several kings brought defilement into the temples and they were judged for. They were removed. They did what was evil inside of the Lord. And it actually is what led up to to and partially what led up to um, their captivity in Babylon um, because they were bringing other gods. I mean, Solomon did it. And, even during the dark ages, the 400 years between the, the Old Testament and the crossover of the New Testament, the time of the Maccabees, when we have Antiochus Epiphanes that came in and desecrated the temple and put sacrificed pigs on the altar and all of these different things. It was, it was a desecration to God. So now we are the temple. Our bodies are temple. We And Christ lives in us. God lives in us. And just like the temple, the tabernacle, which was the Bible actually tells us is a replica of the temple in heaven. See, it's a replica of what's in heaven. But it's three layers, out, a outer, inner, and, and holy of holies. And we are three layers. We are body, soul, and spirit. So we too, we now are the tabernacle, all right? And our outer court represents our flesh. And our inner court represents our soul. And our holy of holies is our spirit. And the spirit is what becomes born again. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, see, prior to you accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you were born body and soul. You're not body, soul, and spirit. See, when Adam sinned, that soul part, that spirit part went dormant. The lights went out, so to speak. All right? And so when Jesus, when we get to Jesus in John chapter 3, and he's talking to Nicodemus who came to him by night, and he says, you know, verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of heaven. You know, Nicodemus couldn't understand me. He said, what the heck are you talking about? You know, can an old man go back into his mother's womb a second time? And then the Lord's like, well, don't marvel at what I say. Was born of the flesh is of the flesh. and was born of the spirit is the spirit, he says to him. And, he, and, he, and so the thing is, is that what is happening is that when he says born again, see, you're born once in the flesh, but your spirit is dormant. It's, it's your body and soul. So what born again really means? is that that spirit, that core is awakened. It is birth inside of you. It is the spirit of God. It is the spirit of the living God coming into you, awakening you. And so you become body, soul, and spirit. When you, the day that you confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, okay? So now you're, you're a living tabernacle now. And the spirit of the Lord is living inside of you now. 
he that holy of holies, right? So the interesting thing is that the scripture that talks about how our bodies are a holy temple of the Lord, what people never read is the next verse. You know, one of the things that irritates me is how people don't read the whole Bible. You know, I, I always encourage people, look, get out of those books. Quit reading the apocryphas. And I'm not saying that the apocryphas and all of these extra books. I mean, I own all of those books. Uh, somebody asked me the other day about talking about the book of Enoch. I'm like, no, I don't teach out of books outside of the 66 books of the Bible. But some of us need to get out of these books, whether it's the, the pastor so-and-so, bishop so-and-so, pastor. We're, we're so caught up in books. And did you read this book? So the people ask me, I said, well, have you read this book? I'm like, no, I don't even know what that is. And they're, they're like, well, this book says, isn't it? I don't, all the revelation that I need is in my Bible. Between the Bible and the Holy Spirit, that's all the revelation that I need. Now, do I have books that I read? Yes, I have a small collection of books that I really like. You know, I have some of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Apocryphas and all that stuff, but that's not where I spend my study time. I'll reference here and there. My study time is in the Word of God. And see, and, and that's another thing that's missing. We're 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 reading other we're we're reading man's dialect on the Word of God instead of reading the Word of God for ourselves. That's a big problem. And all of this is affecting what is the most important thing of all, and that's Prayer time, our prayer time. So when people talk about listening or hearing the word of God or hearing God's voice, it starts in your prayer time, which is your foundation. And if you're not spending enough time with God, then you're not going to hear his voice. That's the end of the story. If you're so busy trying to read people's books, if you're so busy out here running from one conference to another and trying to get somebody to lay hands on you and give you a prophetic word. You, when the Bible says he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. Well, the secret place is not somebody's conference. The secret place is not in somebody's book or DVD. The secret place is you being able to go where Jesus talks about it in uh, Matthew chapter 6 when he's teaching the disciples on how to pray. He said what? He said, go into your secret place and shut the door behind you. Remember that? He says that. He says, go into your secret place, shut the door behind you. So your secret place, you know, a lot of us, we have it. We don't even have secret places. We're running around. We're praying in our cars. You know, that's that's you, you. I'm not saying that you God can't talk to you in your car, but that's not spending quality time. You can't spend quality time with God if you're in a car and rush hour traffic, trying to get to work, trying not to hit the person to the left of you and cuss out the person to the right to you. That's I mean, you're it, that's not spending quality time with God. You cannot spend quality time with God if your prayer time has been limited to 10, 15 minutes a day. No. A lot of times we, we're praying and we're praying, but when we're sleepy, we're praying when we're hungry, we're praying when we're angry, when we're distracted, and all of these things have to do with the outer court. So remember I told you body, soul, spirit, right? Flesh, soul, spirit. Body, soul, spirit. Outer court, inner court, holy of holies, right? So your prayer time is like your tabernacle. You have three layers. The Holy of Holies is where the Spirit of the Lord is. It's when you get, when you come to the, into the glory of God. See, there's a difference between glory and anointing. There's a difference. A lot of people don't know that. The anointing is not the glory. There's a difference. Okay? And, and so when you get into the Holy of Holies and you get to the glory of God, that's when you hear his voice. You get to the glory of God, you can't even talk, all right? But we, we can't get to the glory because we're still stuck outside in the, the outer court. And let me tell you, you're not going to get to that holy of holies in 15 minutes. You're not going to get there in five. You're not going to get there in 20. You're just not. And so because of that, people have limited their prayer time and they're not spending quality time with God. And then they wonder why they're not hearing his voice. Jesus said, my sheep, my sheep know my voice. Think about that. Sheep. He didn't say goats. He didn't say wolves and snakes. He said, my sheep know my voice. So 
If you don't know the voice of God, the question is, are you a roaming sheep? Are you a sheep at all? Mm, good question. Are you a goat? See, a lot of us claim we're sheep, but we live goat lifestyles. You know, are you a sheep that's ran off somewhere? A sheep that's lost? You need to get back to your shepherd. And I'm not talking about pastors so and so on the corner of fifth and third and, and, and Ebenezer Baptist Church. I'm talking about the true shepherd, the good shepherd, who is Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, who said, my sheep know my voice. So it comes, the, the core of hearing God's voice comes with prayer. That's the core of it. It's prayer. And we don't hear because we don't have a prayer line. We really don't. We're praying here and there and everywhere. And now, you know, Jesus, oh, help me, Father, God, bless me, forgive me, all of this stuff. And then we, you know, in Jesus' name, amen. And we're gone. We're gone. I remember, and I've talked about this, I actually wrote about this on one of my commentaries at the, towards the end of last year. I talked about how this happened in about four years ago. The Lord spoke to me one night. I was in prayer. It was like two o'clock in the morning. I'm on my knees in the dark. The whole house is quiet. Everybody, my husband, my children, everybody sleep. And the Lord speaks to me out the blue, like interrupts my thought pattern of my prayer. He says, my children treat me like an idol. And I was like, okay, you know, where are you, where are you going with this? And he told me, he says, think of an idol. I said, all right, Lord, I thought of an idol. I thought of Buddha, right? You know, I mean, you go to the nail shops and you get your pedicures and most of those places have Buddhas in them, right? I said, okay, Lord, Buddha. He said, well, what do you know about Buddha? I said, I don't know, but this big old fat guy, you know, they, they, I see him sitting by the, the cash register all the time in the restaurants and, you know, at the pedicure shops. And he says, well, what do they do to Buddha? I said, I don't know, Lord, I haven't seen coffee and fruit and dumplings. They be trying to feed that sucker. I don't know what, you know, I've seen. I've seen them burn incense, you know, all this stuff. He says, well, what do people do when they go see Buddha or when they go pray to Buddha? He's asking me these weird questions. I'm like, where are you going with this? I said, I've, I've seen they burn their incense and their prayer. And, you know, he says, well, what do they do after? When, what do they, he said, what do they do when they finish praying? I said, they say amen. I, I didn't know. I was like, they say amen. He asked me a second time. He says, what do they do? I says, well, they, they leave, I guess. He says, why do they leave? Because they're done? Because they're finished? He said a second time. Why do they leave? I said, because I guess they're finished with their prayer, Lord. I don't know. He asked me a third time. He says, why do they leave? So I figured I was in trouble. I said, Lord, I don't know. Why don't, why don't, I said, Lord, you know, I don't know. I said, Lord, why do they leave? He says they leave because they never expect that idol to answer them. He said, my children treat me like an idol. See? And we go into our prayer time and we're so selfish and we're so religious. We're not transparent. We have this preconceived motion of how God wants us to pray to him, right? So we go in here and we're like, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. By you know, we go into these things, you know, where, you know we, we get on our white gloves, and I'm just using this hypothetically. You know, we put on our three-piece suits and we anoint our heads and we get all religious and we sit down and we're like, well, sure. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come to you before you, God, today, and we just bless your holy name, Father God. And it, God doesn't really care about that. That does not impress him. It doesn't. We go into prayer and we say things like, we say, forgive me, bless me, help me, deliver me, you know, you know give me, 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 me. Get my drift? And then we say in Jesus' name, amen, and we leave. Because like, you know, he was going to say something. We go in and it's about us. And then we leave. And we're like, oh, he answered my prayer. We're not communing with him. The father desires communion. See, that's, that's what we're missing. The father desires communion. He wants you to sit at the table with him. 
Remember in Revelation chapter 3? So we're, we're, okay, so we get into the book of Revelation. 1, 2, and 3 talks about the seven churches, right, which represents seven church ages, right? When we get to the church of Laodicea, so notice when we get through all the churches, the first six churches, he's on the inside, he's talking about what he likes, he's talking about what he doesn't like, right? This is the problem I have with you. This is what I don't have a problem. But by the time he gets to the church of Laodicea, notice that he's not on the inside of the church anymore. He's on the outside, knocking. By the time he gets to Laodicea, he's been kicked out altogether. And then he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's kicked out at that point. The Laodicea church who... What did they say? Oh, we have everything. We have everything. That's the church we live in today. That's the mindset that we live in today. But they didn't realize the Bible says, Jesus said, but you were poor, blind, wretched, miserable, and naked before me. But they thought they had everything. They thought they were so wrapped up in that they had everything. They didn't even realize that Jesus wasn't even in there anymore. He was outside. Knocking, saying, hello, let me in, let me in, I'm out here, y'all lock me out. He didn't even know it. But notice what he says, he says, behold, I stand at the door now. If anybody lets me in, what does he say? He said, I will come in and sup with them. That's what the King James Version said. Other translation says, I will come in and we will have a meal together and we will be friends. See, that's communion, sitting, having a meal. Think about intimacy, what brings people together, food, right? You know, and we'll talk about that later, but he wants to commune. He, see, he wants you to sit at his table. He wants to break his bread with you, right? Well, what's the bread? The, the bread is the word of God. And he even said, I am the bread of life, Right? We're not spending enough time with him because we're stuck in the outer court. What I'll say in closing, I have to go because these can only be about an hour long. The outer court represents our flesh. All right. When we went to the outer court in the temple, the tabernacle, the outer court was what was what was considered the trampling ground. OK, Jew and Gentile could be in the outer court, but the outer court, the furniture that was in the tabernacle, the outer court is where the bronze and the bronze altars were. OK, and the altars was where they made the sacrifices. Well, what were the purpose of the sacrifices? The, the purpose of the sacrifices was to cover your sins. Right. So the outer court was where these sacrifices were made. So even when Jesus, when he died, they took him out of the, the, the city walls. Remember that? So he was, you know, the, remember, this is all the fulfillment that Christ did, you know, during Passover as a sacrificial life. But he was not, he wasn't sacrificed inside the city walls. He was taken to the outer court where he was sacrificed. As a lamb. So the outer court, which was a trampling ground, was where the altar was, where they, the bronze altars, where they did the sacrifices, right? So you couldn't get into the Holy of Holies without passing up the sacrifice, the, the blood covenant that had to cover your sins first, all right? So the, what, what is it about us? What, what is the most sinful thing on us? Our flesh. Our flesh. So the first layer of prayer is getting past that bronze altar, getting past your flesh, all right? And see, so many of y'all, y'all don't even spend enough time to get past that first layer. So you, you, you're not even hearing his voice. You're not even getting his voice because you stay outside in that out of court and then you say amen and you're off. The outer layers where you die to self. Your flesh gets put on the altar, okay? You, you, you get it all out. Whatever repenting you need to do, whatever confessing you need to do, whatever, you know, whatever you need to do for the day, you get it out. But you don't stop there. And that's what a lot of people stop. They get it all out, and then they say, in Jesus' name, amen, and they're off. You haven't even penetrated into the inner court yet. And again, the goal is to enter into the glory. 
The goal is to come behind the veil so that you can hear the voice of God, right? Sometimes, depending on how tough your flesh is and how undisciplined you are in your prayer life, let me just be honest with you. You may spend 45 minutes in that out of court. When I've trained people, you know, in the, in the in the beginning years of my ministry, I do a lot of mentoring. I'm starting it back up again with a lot, doing a lot of mentor for people who are getting, you know, just fresh getting saved, or um, people who are coming back to Christ, or who have been become stagnant in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And when they would ask me, you know, well, Mina, well, how how long should I pray? I tell them an hour minimum. Listen, if you can't give God an hour of your day, what are you doing? There's 24 hours in a day. You can't give them an hour? What's wrong? I mean, shoot, even the tithes is 10%. You know? 10% of 24 hours is is 2 hours and 40 minutes. If, if it's 10% of 12 hours in a day, it's an hour and 20 minutes. Why can't we give God that? What's wrong with us? Why can't we set aside now and go, oh, well, I got kids, I got this, I got to listen, I got kids. I, one time I was a single mom of three kids. I had three babies in three years. I raised some children by myself for some years. I had a full-time job in the medical field. I was raising three kids who at the time were in elementary school. And I had started a ministry. And I still put a schedule out where I was able to give God that time. Now I'm dead in some more. Now I'm a wife and mother and minister and all kinds of stuff. And guess what? I still put that time in. Sometimes my hours are odd. Sometimes I get up at 2 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes I have the Lord to wake me up. I'm like, wake me up. I asked him that the other night. I had some things I needed to do. I said, Lord, I really have to go and do this. I said, get me up tonight, you know, and I'll come in and spend time with you. Boom, he woke me up. Wake me up at 2.30. I went in the prayer. I was in there for an hour and 45 minutes and some change. That's when I hear him. That's when I talk to him. That's when I hear his voice. And it, that, to me, is the perfect time because everything's quiet. You know, Jesus went away into the fourth watch to pray. Uh, the fourth watch is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. You know, and he went away and he prayed during that time a lot, too. And so, you know, I'm not saying that you have to get up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. That's not what I'm saying. But you have to set aside that time. You know, here's the thing. You know, what, how, how close or do you want to be to him? You know, we're, we're, we, we want, see, we, you want something in life, you go after it, right? You want to get a degree in, in whatever, in, in law and in, in psychology. Whatever. Well, you're determined to go to college, right? You're determined to buy those books, pay your tuition, show up for class, pass those tests. We do it in the flesh. If we want a job, we, we study for the job, we study for the interview, we study to pass the test, all of this stuff to get our jobs, get these careers, to make this money. But we won't put that same effort in to get to know the Lord. And and you may have all of this stuff on the outside, but spiritually you're anorexic. You know, you're spiritually dying, you know, because we're not putting in the time that we need with the Father. That's why you hear me talk about all the time about, you know, some of you guys that spend so much time on social media. You're, 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 you're so, you can't get through the day. Me and my husband were just talk about fasting from our phones. Well, we don't have to pick up our phones and look at it after a certain time. I've had to tell husbands. In my ministry, get off the phone. Their wives complaining about it. I'm like, listen, seven o'clock, shut the phone down. Pay attention to your wife and your kids. And and we're not doing it. You know, we're so caught up, you know, television, cable, bills, socializing, work, kid, you know, all of this, and we're not putting God first. By the time we get to God, He gets the tail end. He gets the leftovers of our day. We go to God when it's like 15 minutes till our bedtime, and we're exhausted, we're full, we're groggy, we're all of these things. And then we get into prayer and we start, you know, falling asleep. Oh, Father, how the hell? <clears throat> you know, you, oh, and you joke, oh, God, forgive me. Oh, oh, God, you know I'm sleepy. I'm sleepy. You know, that's what we do. We give him the leftovers. You remember, that's how, that's how Cain got in trouble. See, Cain. Cain's sacrifice was not acceptable, not because of what it was, but because it was the quality of it. He didn't give God his best. He gave God leftovers. Abel gave his best. See, 
God is giving you his best, but we won't give him our best. Oh, but we expect him to give us his. We want the best from God. We go to God and we ask God for everything that's the best. God never gives us hand-me-downs. He never gives us second best. He gives us quality. Even when he listens to our prayers, he hears us. We have his undivided attention, but we don't give it to him. We want, we give him leftovers. We're rushing through everything. And again, and we wonder why we're not growing. We wonder why we become stagnant in our walk with Christ. We're wondering why we don't feel the presence of God. The anointing's not manifesting in our lives. We wonder why we can't hear his voice. Or I think it's his voice, but I'm so confused. And this and that night, and be, some of y'all hear the devil more often than you hear God. And this is the reason why. This is the reason why. So you got to get past that out of court. Spending quality time with God, getting past that bronze altar of sacrificing so that you can get all your flesh out the way. When you get into prayer, listen, don't go to prayer hungry. Do not go into prayer sleepy. You know, don't, don't go into prayer when you know the baby's going to start crying in 15 minutes and the kids are going to start cutting up. No. You know, you, you get those things out of, you know, when I was a single mom for several years, I used to have to pray and ask God to give me balance. I would say, God, balance me. Help me to strike a balance in my home so that I can get everything done and still be able to spend time with you. And he did that for me. But see, it's all about how bad you want. We make up excuses. You know, we're a society full of excuses. We justify and we compromise constantly. We strain out gnats and swallow camels. Remember that line? Jesus told the Pharisees that. We're straining out gnats. We want to nitpick at everything that doesn't really matter, but then we're swallowing whole entire camels in the process. We're full of compromise and justification. And this is why we're not moving anywhere spiritually. This is the reason why we don't see mighty moves of God in this country. Because the pastors are not teaching us. We're not being taught it. And then the people who are not being taught it by leaders, because the leaders are too focused on saying, follow me, follow me, follow me, read my book, come to my conference, put money in my bank. And if it isn't that, then the people who are following those leaders, they won't pick up a Bible and learn it for themselves. Well, let me check to see what the scripture says about that. What does God say? No. We're not asking the Holy Spirit for revelation, for discernment. We're, in some places, we're not even seeking the unction of the Holy Spirit, who is the truth bearer, who will never lie to you who will always reveal truth and revelation to you. No, we're too busy following people, following things, keeping up with statuses, arguing with folks, bickering, reading books. We're doing everything but what we're supposed to do, and that's dwelling in the secret place of the Most High God. Okay? So I'm going to stop there. So be part one. It'll probably be at least three, maybe four. We'll just we'll pick up next time and we'll start talking about the inner court, how you get past that first letter level of the outer court, which is your flesh, to go into the inner court. We'll talk about the, the artifacts. You know, when, when you between now and then, you guys go and study the tabernacle. We'll look at the artifacts because there's furniture in there. We talked about the the bronze temple seat in the inside or the bronze altar on the outer court. In the inner court, there was furniture. There was the table of shoe bread. There was the menorah. Um, there was the altar of incense. And we're going to go over all of that. I'm going to tell you the revelation of what that means and how it relates to your prayer life and communion with the son and then the father, the son who's the door, who's the way to get behind that veil. And to enter into the Holy of Holies and to enter into the glory of God. We're going to talk about all of that. And I guarantee you, listen, I've been teaching this for over a year. And I know people who have applied this to their lives. I have not seen one. I have not heard one report back that said it didn't work. You begin to apply this to your life, you will have major breakthroughs. Major breakthroughs because, and, 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 you know, I could have easily put this into a deep three-part DVD and said, okay, you know, for $29.95, you guys could come and, you know, you know, buy my CD and I will tell you how to hear the voice of God. And then you got to send a love offering. No, 
I really want you guys to be able to hear the voice of God for yourself because that way you won't be so deceived and you won't be tossed to and fro with the wind following all these diverse things and people, but that you'll know God for yourself because that's what God is looking for. He's looking to, he wants to commune with you for you and him yourselves because when you stand before God, ain't nobody going to be around you. Bishop so and so, prophet so and so, so called prophet. But Mina, I'm not going to be there with you. You have to give account to yourself, your actions, your prayer time, and how you have or have not allowed God's glory to shine through your life. And you're not going to be able to blame anybody because ain't nobody going to be to your left or to your right. They're going to be, it's just going to be you and God. So now is the time to build that relationship, that rock solid relationship with him so that you can hear his voice for yourself. That's what this is about. So we're going to stop there. So I pray that this was enriching to all of you. For those of you who tuned in with us um, this evening, God bless all of you all. Okay. I'll leave this up for a while. Um, we'll, we'll pick up sometime next week. All right. So God bless you all. Have a good night. Shalom.